please join me in welcoming Mary Sharon Ford. Thank you, Anne. It's a privilege to uh, launch Church Women United's New Year and uh, to uh, launch this new series of forums. So I'm very happy to be here and be part of this. And I'd like to say welcome to all our guests. Uh, I see some friends I haven't seen in a while, so that's lovely to have you all with us. You each have a program journal in front of you. So this has all of my slides and plenty of room to capture ideas and notes. So if you need a pen, hold up your hand and Cindy will get you a, a pen. There's some on that table. Um, and there will be times when I will say, now write this down, because it's going to be that good and that important. So uh, the teacher in me will be coming out. And because I'll probably talk for you know, a full amount of time, I will be available for conversation at the book table afterwards for your questions, comments, and whatnot. So I'd like to uh, begin by just saying how I got connected with Church Women United uh, many years ago. Uh, I, at my church, there was a lovely lady. Her name was Dorothy Sistrom of Beloved Memory. And she never pressured me. She never says, now you need to be part of this organization. But she would just simply say, oh, we're going to be talking about this, or here's a little brochure, or a flyer of something that you might be interested in. Well, this went on for a couple of years. And finally I realized Dorothy isn't going away. <laughs> church Women United isn't going away. And you know what? I'm not going away. So why don't we just all get together? Well, the irresistible invitation was when Anne came and said, you know, I will buy you breakfast <laughs> if you will attend a Tuesday morning forum. And I was hooked. So I've never looked back from there. So today we're going to take a look at charity or systems change. You'll notice the question mark after each of those phrases. So I'm going to talk on five little topics. Um, first of all, taking a look at charity or systems change, what we mean by that. Then I'm going to take a fresh look at the word imagination. It's a beautiful word uh, that is uh, full of potential for us. Then I'm going to ask, what did Jesus imagine? And then I'm going to ask, today, what does Francis imagine, Pope Francis, uh, who seems to be um, uh, 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 with great moral clarity on the world stage. What does Francis imagine? And then I will ask the question, how might we imagine today? Because in the end it comes down to us actually taking action. And then we will have some table questions uh, to follow up with all of that. I'd like to share with you first off a couple of questions. I call them accountability questions that I have to sit with from time to time. So I want to share them with you. The first question is, how does my prayer life or my interior life shape my action in the world? The other question is, how does my action in the world actually shape my prayer life or my interior life? Those two must be in conversation. So I'll share those accountability questions with you. They're a great way to start the new year. So I'd like to begin, as I always do, with a piece of scripture. So I'm going to share a little passage from the Gospel of Mark. It's a story you may be familiar with, and uh, I'd like to share it now uh, with fresh ears. So this is from... Mark chapter 6. This is called the feeding of the 5,000. So you might know that story. So the, the back story is Jesus has sent out his disciples on their first mission. They've been out on the road. They've just come back. It's the perfect moment for debriefing, for sort of winding down. And Jesus says, let's come away to a quiet place. So he's thinking, you know, get across the, the, uh, the lake and just sit with the guys in a quiet place and have some time together. 
Well, I don't know how this works in his time, but 5,000 people got word that he was going to get in the boat and cross the lake and be across the lake. So there are already 5,000 people waiting, anticipating his arrival. He's tired. His men are tired. They just want a break. And that's where the story picks up. When Jesus disembarked and saw the vast crowd, his heart was moved with pity for them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So there's a teacher in him. He sees that they need to be fed in that, that interior way, so he teaches them. By now, it was already late, and his disciples approached him and said, this is a deserted place, and it is already very late. They're in practical mode. Jesus is in teaching mode. We sort of have two different conversations going on at this moment. It's already very, very late. And they say to the master, dismiss them so that they can go to the surrounding farms and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Very practical, huh? Jesus says to them in reply, give them some food yourselves. Now this almost sounds like a write-off or, you know, kind of a little bit of a snarky thing to say. Go feed them yourselves. And they say, are we to buy 200 days wages worth of food and give it to them to eat? I mean, they're looking at how impossible the situation is. But he doesn't answer that question. He says to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Well, clearly we know they're not going to have enough loaves to feed 5,000 people. And when they had found out, they said, five loaves and two fish. So Jesus gave orders to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. The people took their places in rows of hundreds and fifties. Then, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he said the blessing. He broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the fish among them all, among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And they picked up 12 wicker baskets full of fragments and what was left of the dried fish. Those who ate of the loaves were 5,000 men. Which makes us maybe wonder, there might have been more than 5,000. There might have been some families there. So this is astonishing. Something is going on here, and it is not magic. Something is going on here which is instructive for us, and we wonder what it is. I'm actually going to return to this passage in a little bit to pick up the thread on that. So I'd like to talk about charity or systems change. I'm going to give you a couple of definitions, and you can write these down. Charity equals to a company with compassion. Charity does not mean a handout. It means to accompany. You can circle that word accompany to journey at least for a little bit with another. And to do it with compassion, compassio, which means to suffer with the other a little bit, to feel their pain in some way. Pope Francis wrote something recently that really caught my attention. He writes, to put coins in a poor person's cup 
and keep walking is an insult to that person's humanity. An insult to that person's humanity. So to accompany with compassion. Well, I don't give out money. I'm downtown a lot. I walk the streets downtown. I'm downtown a lot. I don't give out money. But I do have sandwiches in my backpack. And in warm weather, I have bottles of water also. And sometimes I leave the house and I forget to put sandwiches in. And there I am, encountering somebody. So a couple of months ago, I was walking downtown. I was down near the transit center. And I thought, great, I've got enough time to uh, uh, go to the Kiva, get a few items, and, and get back and, and get back on my bus uh, with plenty of time to spare. So I'm walking along the side of the transit center. There's a brick wall there. And I see this person bent over, I'm thinking perhaps with arthritis bent completely over. I can't see the person's face. Completely bent over. And I keep walking. I think, well, I can't see the person's face. I guess I have nothing to say. And I walk past. And in that instant, I am convicted. I stop. I turn around. And I walk back. And I say to the person, how are you doing today? They shake their head. And I'm just thinking, dear God, it's not a good day. And I said, do you have anything to eat today? I see the head shake, no. I still don't see the face, no. And I said, you know, I'm going across the street to the Kiva. Would you like to go with me and we can get you a sandwich from the deli and something to drink? Would you like that? Yeah. So uh, we struggle across the street and we go into the uh, kiva. And I say, well, the deli section is right down there. The beverages are here. I have to pick up a, a couple of items and I'll see you at the counter, the checkout counter. We'll meet there. Does that sound good? Yeah, that sounds good. So uh, come to find out, we get a sandwich, we get a bottle of carrot juice. And I begin to understand what Pope Francis is writing about. The dignity of the other must be called forth. And so we walked back across the street, and I still had plenty of time to get on my bus. Nothing was lost. Love was exchanged. So to accompany with compassion. Uh, in fact, I will share with you what I am learning. In fact, this is on your, the little bookmark that I gave you for your program. I will share with you what I am learning. And I am learning lesson by lesson, encounter by encounter. To live for Jesus, I discover, is to live for those most hidden within his poverty, who will be hidden where I am hidden too when I embrace the one who is poor. I am learning that those words do not come easily. They are enfleshed words. So I'd like to talk now about my next definition, which is systems change. What do we actually mean by systems change? Well, I describe systems change as a massive societal conversion of heart. Massive societal conversion of heart that benefits those most at the margins, those who are most fragile, most excluded, most vulnerable. So there's an incredible challenge embedded in this phrase, systems change, a massive societal 
conversion of heart. When I think of, let's say, the people of uh, this town, I think of the people of this state, this nation, I sometimes think that we're a bunch of cats moving off in different directions. And a massive conversion of heart would be like trying to herd cats. How do we get there? You know, I find it's easier to uh, focus on personal sin, especially when it's somebody else's. It's easier. Than to admit my participation in structural sin, in systemic sin. It might be racism, something we're still looking at in this day and age. It might be the sin that sneaks in when I cash in on my privilege and my place in society. In fact, I notice uh, some, on certain buses, when I board certain buses that go to certain parts of town, I notice there might be 10 or 15 of us waiting to board the bus. I notice the people who step back to open the way for me to board first. And I'm thinking, this is not right. I refuse to do that. So what I do is I hang way in the back. They don't know I'm going to get on the bus. Let them all enter, and then I get on the bus. Which means I get to sit next to people who maybe are just like me, or maybe are not just like me. So there's that conversion that happens at the personal level. I am heartened, uh, actually, when it comes to systems change, to follow the uh, series that's been published in the Register Guard, the Eugene Register Guard, on homelessness and solutions to homelessness, where the local newspaper is making it easy for our community to enter into conversation on solutions that will benefit people at the margins. That's part of how systems change happens, through a forum like that and the invitation to participate in that forum. So charity begs for systems change. It is not right that people should have to beg on the street corner for their daily food. It is not right that families should have to be in the desert crossing the hot terrain because they don't have a home anymore. They don't have a town anymore, but they don't know where to go. There's human brokenness, which is a sign of systems failure. Human brokenness is a messenger of systems failure. Just even in our own nation, we look at the opioid epidemic. That's telling us something. Something is radically not working. We look at chronic homelessness. That is a messenger telling us that something is radically not right in the human community. We look at massive, endless waves of refugees. Every one of them messengers that something is radically wrong in how we be as a human family, as human community. Conversely, Systems that are designed for the good, and I will talk about some, actually set us free to respond to human vulnerabilities. Uh, I came across this quote again from Pope Francis. He seems to be everywhere. He was addressing the European Union and taking them a little bit to task for their reliance on uh, commission studies and statistics and looking at, you know, the numbers and how that all fits together. And he says, sadly, we see how frequently issues get reduced to discussions about numbers. You know, if you think of quotas and budgets and profitability measures, the reason for this fixation on numbers is clear. People have faces. They force us to uh, assume a responsibility that is real, personal, and effective. Statistics, however useful and important, are arguments. They are soulless. They offer an alibi for not getting involved. 
because they never touch us in the flesh. So I'd like to talk about, for a moment, uh, a system that is designed for the good. This is what I would call a system uh, that reveals the reign of God or reveals the land of the right side up. This is a photograph of women in the uh, Ishkan village in northern Guatemala. My dear friend Kathy is a missionary there, and her work specifically is to rebuild the infrastructure of that community that was decimated back in the 80s, the 90s, during the, the uh, civil strife, the civil warfare. Community was completely devastated. So Kathy's work is to rebuild the economic infrastructure, the educational infrastructure, the social and family infrastructure of this village. So one thing she does is get micro loans, micro financing for the women to build a micro business. And what they do is specialize in fiber animals who produce uh, the fiber and the wool to create fabrics and uh, items for uh, clothing and accessories. So they're able to bring income into the village and support themselves in that way. Now Kathy was talking to me one day and she said, well, you know, in this village, uh, the school system is sort of through eighth grade. It's not really a quality education as we would think of it in the States, but through eighth grade and that, that's the end of education. And I said to the villagers, that's not enough. That's not OK. And she says to me, Mary Sharon, you know I have no money, so I built a school. And I said, wait a minute, Kathy. Say that again. She says, I have no money, so I built a school. Well, to quote, um, uh, to quote uh, uh, Cindy, who was quoting me, give God something to work with. Start building a school. In fact, there's that beautiful German, old German proverb that says, begin to weave and God will provide the thread. Give God something to work with. So Kathy gives God something to work with. And there's a school. And she brought in educators, not just people who could sort of, you know, teach out of the book. She brought in actual educators who are committed to the mission so that young people get an education that can move them forward and rebuild that community. That's an example of systems change for the good. I'm going to bring it in closer to home. The Egan Warming Center is a structure, a very fine-tuned infrastructure that makes it easy for people in the community to do good deeds and to provide a comfortable place for people who are unhoused on bitter cold nights. So Egan is the structure that makes it possible, the system, so to speak, that makes it possible for good things to happen. I'm going to talk more about Egan in a little bit. But for now, we do live in the land of the upside down. And this is a photograph of Wall Street at night, lit up in all of its gilded beauty. But we are not without a moral compass. We do not live without a moral compass. I'm going to share with you a little bit from the Gospel of Matthew, the Beatitudes, which we might be well familiar with. So this is from chapter 5 in Matthew's Gospel. And I'm going to flip the phrases ever so gently to present them in a new light. Where Jesus says, if you want the kingdom of heaven, if you want the land of the right side up, which I think we all do, if you really want that good, then you have to be poor in spirit. If you want to inherit the land, well, that sounds good to me. If you want to inherit, not purchase, but inherit the land, you must be meek. Well, that's counterintuitive, isn't it, within our system? If you want mercy shown to you, 
You have to be merciful. If you want to see God, if you want to see God, you have to be pure of heart. And he says, if you want to be called a child of God, if you want to be called a child of God, you have to be a peacemaker. You have to be a peacemaker. So Jesus gives us a very clear moral compass. Interiorly is where systems change begins. You know, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. There's a wisdom in that. It must begin interiorly. So the most important spiritual act of my adult life, I'm going to share this with you right now. We're talking about systems change and interior conversion of heart. The most important act, spiritual act, of my adult life was to give away my car, to donate it to charity, to St. Vincent de Paul, and to intentionally not replace it. Because I knew that I needed to ride the bus with people who were just like me, and also to ride the bus with people who are not just like me. If you want to know the stories, read my blog. My blog is all about my ongoing conversion of heart. But that was a remarkable beginning for me of conversion of heart. And I have never looked back. It's almost four years now. I have no car lust. I have never looked back. In fact, if a week goes by when I don't need to get on the bus to go downtown, I get on the bus just to walk around because I found I need to be with my peeps. Okay, Matthew 25 also gives us uh, a moral compass. Matthew chapter 25. This is called the judgment of the nations. Not the judgment of the individuals, but the judgment of the nations. The nations. So we're talking systems here. We're talking massive systems. So when the Son of Man comes in his glory, Jesus says, he's giving a parable here, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations, all the nations, will be assembled before him. And he will separate them one from the other, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king, the king, will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And what does he say? He says, for I, the king, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked. I, the king, I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you visited me. The righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did for one of these least of mine, you did for me. He doesn't say, whatever you did on behalf of the middle class, you did for me. He identifies with the ones who have no standing at all. So I'd like to return to that passage from uh, Mark's Gospel, 
the uh, multiplication of loaves. Jesus asks, how much love do you have? Well, there was a day when I was sitting deeply with this passage, sitting, letting the words soak in, being part of that scene, that passage, imagining it, and uh, my creative imagination drifted a little bit. And this is what I came up with. I had to write it down because it kind of surprised me. I call it the multiplication of love. When it was getting late, the disciples suggested to Jesus that the crowds be dismissed so they could go into the local villages to get something to eat. But the logistics of love don't work that way. You give them some love, Jesus replied. At that they said, are we going to spend 200 days wages for love to feed them? How much love do you have, Jesus asked. Go and see. How much love do you have? That's a pretty humbling question, isn't it? If Jesus were to come up to Anne and say, Anne, how much love do you have? You're like, whoa. It should be unlimited stores, but I know it's only that much, right? Go and see, he says. When they figured out how much love they had, they answered this much. He told them to make the people sit down on the green grass. Then, taking the little bit of love that the disciples had gathered, Jesus raised his eyes to heaven, pronounced the blessing, broke the love, and gave it to the disciples to distribute. People fed themselves on love until they had their fill. I mean, this would put Woodstock to shame. They fed themselves on love until they were completely sated. They gathered up enough love to fill 12 wicker baskets. There's love left over in the land of the right side up. Those who had feasted on love numbered 5,000. How much love do you have? That's the question. It's a worthy question. You can write that one down. How much love do I actually have? Well, Jesus works with a little bit of love that you and I have. He doesn't say, oh, come back when you have more. He takes what you have. He accepts the limitations. Okay, so I have a true story. How many blankets do you have? So I participated in this miracle. I was open to it and participated in this miracle of Jesus' multiplication. So it was one night at Egan. And um, I got there about 9.30, 10 o'clock, and my, my first work was to hand out blankets as people were coming in. And there were probably 50 or 60 people in line to come in to get processed and get their blanket and, and go into the sleeping room. And normally, when I get there, there are mountains of big black garbage bags full of blankets, clean blankets, a mountain of bags. And I get there and there's one black garbage bag with blankets. And I said to the shift lead, I said, is this it? We, are there more blankets in the truck or the van? Nope, that's it. And there are about 50 or 60 people waiting to come in. And there are people at my table to get a blanket. So I do the next obvious thing. I pick up the, the bag, I empty the blankets out onto the table and about Ten, eight or ten people get a blanket. Well, the line is long. I look, and there's another bag, another black garbage bag full of blankets. That's odd. Well, I pick it up, empty it out, and give out more blankets. That's the end. And I notice another black garbage bag full of blankets. And I'm thinking, where are these coming from? My back was against the wall. Nobody was walking behind me. And to walk in front of me, they would have had to squeeze between the table and the people in line and the next wall. Nobody was coming through with bags of blankets. 
Well, my job is to keep giving out blankets. So I, I give out blankets. There is continually another bag. At the end, I said to one of the other people, I said, did you see that with the blanket thing? She says, yeah, that happens here. We should expect to participate in the multiplication of love. Whether it's the multiplication of energy at the end of a day when you're exhausted, whether it's the multiplication of money that needs to go toward the good, whether it's the multiplication of loaves in your back, uh, sandwiches in your backpack, we should expect the multiplication of love in our own lives. You can write that down in your notes. We should expect that in our lives. Okay, so I'd like to take a, look, a fresh look at the word imagination. I love this word, imagination. It's not about daydreaming or, you know, kind of going to a place of fantasy. I'm going to give you a definition. Imagination equals that essential image or truth or vision that we carry at the core of our being. That essential vision that we hold of the way life should be. Now, it's a neutral term. I mean, we could hold at the core of our being uh, something uh, very greedy, something very self-centered, or we could carry at the core of our being an image of life in the land of the right side up. That includes a space for everyone. So it's a, it's a neutral term. It depends on what we actually carry at the core of our being. I actually believe that that essential image can change, preferably from what is ungenerous to what is generous. That is called conversion of heart. I believe in the power of conversion of heart. To move from an understanding of the world where I need to get what I need to understanding that there's enough for everybody. I believe that we can undergo, as human beings, undergo that conversion. So to imagine is, first of all, to call forth that central image of how we believe things should be, to actually call that forth. It is hard, perhaps you have noticed, to cling to that central image in a culture and climate of social chaos. To listen to the daily news and remember that is not your reality, what you carry within you from your deeply held beliefs is the reality that we are given to work with. So the second it, uh, me, is to imagine, uh, the second work in imagining is to bring this image that we carry at the core of our being into conversation with the way things are. I think of Debbie. I'm honored to have you here who uh, works with the Catholic Worker House. Coming from that place of a deep and clear vision and bringing that into conversation with the reality in the town that you live in, week after week, bringing what you deeply hold to be true. So bringing this core image into conversation with the way things are, how do you do that? What does that look like? Well, I will share with you a little story. So a few years ago, when I was uh, first getting involved with Church Women United and getting involved in a few other social action uh, groups, I learned that the city council on this particular night was going to be talking about issues around homelessness. And I've always had a place in my heart I don't know why, for that particular topic, that particular concern, and for the people who suffer from not being housed. So I went downtown to, and went to the city council meeting, and I look and I see my peeps. They're all sitting there, and uh, I go find a seat among them. And 
one of them, it might have been Cindy or somebody, turns to me and says, um, so are you going to testify on the issue of homelessness? And I said, nah. As soon as I said, nah, I was convicted. I wanted, in the worst way, to reel that response back in and change it. So there was about five or six seconds of silence. And then I stood up and I said, excuse me, excuse me, as I walked past everybody in the row. And I went to the table at the entrance, filled out the little green card with my name, my address, my phone number, my email address, what district I'm in, the topic I wanted to speak on. And there came a moment in the course of gathering testimony when the mayor called my name. I had my three little bullet points. I said what I needed to say in 45 seconds. Well, I felt good that I had given voice to what I actually cared about. But that's not the end of the story. Many months later, I was in some other part of the country giving a talk, a workshop, and at the break, this participant comes up to me and says, I just Googled your name. Oh. I said, what did you find? I really didn't want to know. I said, what did you find? And he says to me, well, I saw a video of you on YouTube. And I'm thinking, oh, great. What was I saying? He said it was a 45-second video. <laughs> you were testifying at the Eugene City Council on the issue of homelessness. I go like, yeah, that's right. He said, that really meant a lot to me. We should never underestimate the power of our witness for good. We should never underestimate the importance of our advocacy coming from that place of deep conviction. We should never underestimate. So this deep and difficult uh, conversation between what I believe and the way things are is actually prophetic work. That's why it's difficult, because it is prophetic. You can write this down. It is the uncomfortable work of speaking truth with clarity and with love. The prophetic work in this social conversation is the uncomfortable work of speaking truth with clarity and with love. Arrogance Self-assuredness has no place in that conversation. Somebody shared with me recently a line from The Last Jedi, which I think is a new movie that's out. The Last Jedi. So my friend shares with me this quote. We will not win this war by killing what we hate. We will win by saving what we love. We will win by saving what we love. And so we must speak the truth with love. Not just with niceness and kindness toward the person we're speaking to, but with a radical love for this world, which God still so loves. To speak with love. I think of people who've uh, gone before us who've done that speaking with clarity and with love. I think of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who actually had the community of the beloved. He spoke against many things, but he was also known for the community of the beloved, drawing close. I think of Nelson Mandela. I think of Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. I think of Jesus. Speaking with clarity and with love. I think of Gandhi. And I think today of Pope Francis. He loves his enemies. And he speaks with piercing clarity and with genuine love. 
So prophetic equals, I'm going to give you yet another definition, to understand the social urgency of things. To be prophetic means to understand the social urgency of things. Think of the prophet Jeremiah. By the way, the prophets, the biblical prophets, did not fare well. This is not easy work. Uh, actually, do you know who this image is, this person? Major Thomas Egan. Now, I want to say something. The tragic death of retired Major Thomas Egan caused this community to rise up because in that moment it understood the social urgency of things. This community has a prophetic capacity within it. It has proven its prophetic capacity, which means it can prove it again. And hopefully we don't have to wait for another tragedy. This community that we live in and that we love has prophetic capacity. Because I believe at the core of every human being is a spark of the divine that renders us able to do the good. So I want you to find hope in the community that we live in. So a prophetic question that I will pose to Church Women United are we living persuasively? And you can circle that word persuasively. Are we living persuasively from an interior Christian imagination? Think reign of God. Think land of the right side up. This question applies not just to people of Christian faith, but to people who hold deeply their traditions, truths. And I address also people of goodwill, of astonishing goodwill. Every one of us must ask, are we living persuasively in revealing that core image for the good that we hold within ourselves? So I'm going to give you, uh, oh, no, I'm going to do this in just a moment. So what did Jesus imagine? Let's get, let's get back to Jesus. What did he imagine? He imagined the reign of God. You know, he wasn't in it for himself. He understood his mission. He spoke words and did actions that revealed the core of his being, which was love. Love that gives life and calls forth the dignity and the good and the humanity of each. So I'm, I'm actually going to give you a definition for the reign of God. Reign of God equals, you can write this down, the reign of God or the land of the right side up equals systems and processes working the way they should for the good of everyone. We see some systems in place right now that are working for the good of everyone. This is not something reserved for another planet. We see radical good happening now. And sometimes under great duress. So, Jesus didn't work magic. He also did not flip the switch into divine mode. Because what would that be for us? We'd be left with an empty bag. Well, where's Jesus? Because he's the only one who can do this. No. He showed us in the richness of his humanity what every one of us is capable of doing. He showed us how it's done. I like to think that the reign of God is more verb than noun. It is a thing that you do. 
rather than a place where we might be. The reign of God was all Jesus talked about. It's all he did. Uh, actually, there's a passage in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 17, where Jesus says to his uh, followers, the reign of God is among you, which really makes sense of why Christian community gathers, because the reign of God, when we are gathered, is among us. Well, one translation says, the reign of God is within you, not just among you, but within you. You carry the fullness of heaven within you. You carry the fullness already. And our work is to recognize that and call it forth. So Jesus fed the hungry, he healed the sick, he raised the dead. Which, you know, if I could do any of those three, I'd probably be feed the hungry. He fed more people than I'll ever feel, feed. He healed the sick. There are people who have a gift for bringing that healing to people who are ill. Raise the dead. That's a pretty amazing thing. Especially early on, Jesus was doing this in his public ministry. But there came a point, you find this in the Gospels, where Jesus became altogether too much for the people of his time. It's like, put it back in the bag. You know, stop doing all this stuff. You're making us look bad. You know, just put it away. But he didn't know how to. Jesus did not think or act inside the box. Which makes me ask myself, what's my box? What are the limitations I've set up? Not enough time, not enough resources, not enough education, not enough experience. Not enough dot, 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 fill in the blanks. Well, you know, I want to throw away the box. I just want to make it go away. OK, so what did Jesus, Jesus imagine? Did Jesus do acts of charity? Yes, he did. He accompanied with compassion. But he did it from within a different system. He did it from within the reign of God. He did both. His acts of feeding people, of healing people, raising the dead, were acts of accompanying, of true charity, giving the, the only son of the, the widowed mother back, back to her. He brings her, him back to life and gives him back to her. That is incredible compassion for the mother, the widowed mother. So he did it from within a different system. And Jesus challenges us to also work from that same system. A system not dependent on how much money is in the budget. How often do we hear that? There's just not enough money in the budget. Can't take care of health care or education or housing or whatever it might be. Too bad. But it's a system based on, you can write this phrase down, I love it, God's shockingly unrestrained generosity. The reign of God is a system based on God's shockingly unrestrained generosity. And I want you to write these words down and sit with them. Systems change requires... that we deeply and consistently love this world. Systems change requires us to deeply and consistently love this world. I can say of some elected officials whose policies and practices I do not agree with, I can honestly say that I love them. 
I don't have the option of not loving them. Because when I love them, it's not me loving them. It is God loving them through me. It has taken me a while to get there. And it is not easy to say. But if I'm going to love, I have to love that deeply. To defend a space for the humanity of each one. Okay, so in his prayer, you know, the Lord's Prayer, Jesus urges a systems change of heart. There's this radical phrase that we say so easily, your kingdom come. We call this the Lord's Prayer because it was his prayer before he shared it with us. The deep pleading, your kingdom come. This one petition in the Lord's Prayer is the fullness and fulfillment of every other petition in the Lord's Prayer. In fact, I invite you to take a vow for 2018, to vow to pray that phrase every day with deep and courageous intention. Your kingdom come. I'll tell you when I pray this prayer, it's about 5.30 in the morning and I'm standing out in my, my backyard howling my prayers to the, the celestial heavens. And I pray, your kingdom come. And I hold in my heart all the things that are in the news, all the things that are unfinished, contested, unresolved, deeply divisive, I hold it all up in that one position. Your kingdom come. So I invite you to make a vow, to pray that phrase, to speak deeply with intention that phrase every day. OK, so that's what Jesus imagines. Let's take a look at what Francis imagines, a man of our own times. So he's written many things, but his big work is called an encyclical, it's a big word, encyclical, called Laudato Si. Now, I'm not a speaker of Italian, but the full phrase would be Laudato Si, mi Senor. I'm probably doing injustice to the language, which means all praise to you, my Lord, which is the opening line of the canticle of praise of Francis of Assisi. All praise to you. And in this beautiful canticle, Francis of Assisi draws all of creation into giving praise to God in all of its beautiful ways of being. Now, popes write encyclicals, and encyclicals are big works about doctrine that are written for bishops. Well, this document would not be that. It's not so much laying out doctrine. It is laying out the way things are in this world right now. And Pope Francis says uh, that this document is written for every man and every woman living on the planet. He casts a very broad net because he understands that the crisis that we are in is monumental. So Francis names in this letter the broken systems. None of these are new to us. Pollution and climate change, compromised water systems. Who pays the price for compromised water systems? Indigenous people and the poor. Loss of biodiversity, which ties into compromised water systems and climate change. The declining quality of life and the breakdown of society, which is tied into all of these above. Global inequalities. And he includes weak political responses. Francis offers a vision of the world that is integrated. 
I'm going to call it biblical because he understands that everything is connected to everything. A beautiful thing that's happened is because of this document and because of his continuous speaking on behalf of the systems that are broken and need to be changed, because of his speaking out, the moral and spiritual perspective is now part of the conversation on the environment. People are feeling and communities are feeling free to come forward with the moral argument and, and the spiritual argument <coughs> for systems change. So he's really breaking the, the path there and breaking it open for us. So for those of Christian faith, and not limited to them alone, Francis says, in essence, dare to believe and rise up to act. Dare to believe specifically three things. Dare to believe the wisdom of the biblical accounts of creation. Not the literalness, but the wisdom of the accounts, biblical accounts of creation. He says, dare to believe the mystery of the universe. Well, the opposite of believing in the mystery of the universe is believing in my almighty power to do whatever I want and to not have to pay the price. He challenges us to believe the mystery of the universe. And he challenges us to believe in the communion of all creation, where all of creation dwells together in harmony and in fruitfulness and in good. He also challenges us to rise up to act in two specific ways. Through ecological conversion, to recognize if we're part of the problem, we can also be part of that solution. Person by person, household by household, neighborhood by neighborhood, city by city, county, state, region, bioregion, nation. We have the capacity to make that change. Now here's a historic photo. This is uh, from September 2015 when Pope Francis addressed the two houses of Congress. This was amazing. Everyone in that assembly had reason to applaud. And everyone in that assembly had reason to feel skewered. Because Francis doesn't speak to one party or the other. He speaks the truth. Francis insists that especially legislators must be wise stewards of God's creation. Now, that's a convicting word, isn't it? That especially legislators must be wise stewards of God's creation. Just read the newspaper on any given day, and there's reason to weep. I want to share with you uh, a quote from Pope Francis. You know, when he speaks, it's just so eloquent and so dense, so packed with meaning. This is a quote from uh, his address to Congress. And he says, politics, he just wades right into the middle of things. Politics is an expression. It's not a game. It's not a power play. He says it's an expression of our compelling need to live as one in order to build as one the greatest common good, that of a community which sacrifices particular interests in order to share in justice and in peace its goods, its interests, and its social life. Politics has a purpose. It's not to win power. It's to actually facilitate the good of all. 
to facilitate those systems and structures that enable good things to happen for the good of all. By the way, if you would like uh, his address to Congress, uh, you do have a sheet of paper that uh, lists all the bonus items that are available. I'm happy to send you bonus items uh, related to this talk. So if you would like that, check that off and leave it in the basket on the book table. All right. Francis claims his place in the political conversation. And he urges us to do the same. I came across this photo. I forgot I had that. Yes, that would be a picture of me. And yes, this would be a day at the state capitol when uh, I got on the bus with a number of women from Church Women United and a few other organizations. And we all went up to advocate for health care for everyone. And uh, we rallied outside on the capitol steps. And we went inside and met with our legislators and had a grand day. Uh, this is one of the benefits of Church Women United is we actually join forces and feel the, uh, the goodness of one voice. So uh, yeah, somebody captured that photo. Advocacy days. So I think about health care. That was the issue we were there for. But health care, human health, and the condition of the environment are tied together. Human health and the condition of the economy are tied together. Sadly, when we think of the condition of the economy, we think, is the stock market up or down? But that's not what economy means for people who don't even have a kitchen where they can prepare a decent meal for their family. Economy means something very different from that. OK, so Francis imagines that we will actually claim our place in that political conversation. So I'd like to ask now, how shall we imagine today? Well, there's a beautiful photo here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's the day in bitter cold winter weather a few years back when we gathered in the parking lot at Episcopal Church of the Resurrection, installing three Conestoga huts on their foundations. You can see Father Brent in the middle. He's doing heavy lifting. Others are doing heavy lifting. Uh, a couple of the unhoused people there are doing the heavy lifting, getting the Conestoga huts in place and uh, uh, bringing about the completion of those huts. That, for me, was such a beautiful experience of community. The mayor was there. Some city council members were there. Media was there. Some people I knew from different circles were there. I felt happy being part of that experience of community. And it's not just putting up three Conestoga huts. The three people who are now housed are actually part of that community. It's not just like, well, we'll give you a part of our parking lot, and here's a porta potty and good luck. Meals are shared. Bread is broken. Love is part of the conversation. It's a beautiful thing. Now, down at the bottom, you may not be able to see this photo very well. It's a photo I took from a front page article from the Eugene Register Guard. It was a story that really caught my heart and my attention. A story of a four-year-old boy. And he saw on TV a clip of unhoused people who live under tarps down by the river. This four-year-old boy struggled with that reality. And he said to his mom, his mom said to the press, I had nothing to do with this. But he said to his mom, I want to sell my, some of my books, some of my toys, and I want to make enough money to buy some boxes of pizza and take them to the people down by the river. And so the photo here is of this four-year-old boy opening up one of the pizza boxes and one of the uh, people down by the river is looking in and ready to eat some pizza. That's not the end of the story. I was in another part of the country giving a talk, and I spoke about this. Had the little photo, told the story. After the talk, a gentleman came up to me. And he said, he had tears in his eyes. 
And he said, I need to thank you for that story that you told about the four-year-old boy selling his items and buying pizza for the unhoused down by the river. He looked me in the eye and he said, my brother is one of those men. He said, we've been trying for years to find him and be in touch with him. We have no way to communicate. My brother is one of those men. And I thought, generally, like down by some river? No, he meant on the Willamette River. We must never underestimate the power of our capacity for good. Because God has a big interest in other people catching the sparks of that good. Because it's not our good. It is the good of God. It is the good of mercy beyond our understanding. So I love that photo. Okay. Where am I here? Okay. So being, you know, humans that we are, we are social by nature, which means we live in family, we live in neighborhoods, we live in a community, a town, a county, a region, a state. We live in a nation, a world, which means that political conversation must happen. And I do not mean partisan conversation. I mean real political conversation, where we as part of the body politic contribute to a better way a better understanding. Our political conversation is meant to serve the common good. So our political conversation is the way we navigate through the systems that affect our lives. Whether it's the insurance system, or whether it's the health care system, or whether it's, you know, the IRS and paying your taxes, or whatever system it might be, educational system, all kinds of systems, systems of governance. Our political conversation is the way we navigate and make sense of these social systems. Uh, this is a photo of um, Keithy Square, sort of the center of town. Last year at this time, uh, when we had Inauguration Day, which was in early January, uh, a number of us, some religious leaders, other people in the community gathered down at Kesey Square. And during that time of the inauguration, we lifted up the nation. And we prayed a blessing on our nation, on the systems that make our nation work, on our elected officials, our leaders. We stood in the town square and held open a space for blessing and good on what lie ahead. So this square is dear to me. So political conversation at best is prophetic, speaking truth with clarity and love. And therefore it is dangerous and therefore political conversation demands courage. Political conversation demands courage. At uh, different, someplace I have written these words which I'll share with you. When I speak of courageous conversation, which is what political conversation is, when I speak of courageous conversation, I really mean the one conversation you would rather not have. Because you know that it will change you. Now, maybe it won't change my thinking, but it might change me in understanding I actually have a voice. I can contribute to the larger conversation in my town, in my state. It is the one conversation of greatest invitation and greatest challenge. So, what does this mean for people of Christian faith? And I'm going to say for people who hold at the core of their being whatever their tradition of truth is. And I would say for people also 
of profound goodwill. For all of us, the starting point for conversation on systems change is humbly acknowledging human and creational suffering. It's not starting with the moral high ground. It's not starting with answers. It's starting with the humble acknowledgement that things are not working right. A humble acknowledgement and doing it with love. In fact, the only reason we would enter into political conversation is because of our unshakable love for this world, which God still so loves. If you take humility and love out of the equation, as the Apostle Paul would say, we're just an empty gong. I have found in my travels, and I've been among many, many uh, uh, congregations, many uh, communities of faith, many congregations, I find that the congregations that are most actively given to social change are the ones that actively bring today's suffering in the world into their prayer, their collective prayer. If you can name it, you can begin to care about it. If you can care about it, you are likely going to act in some way. So faith communities must bring into their collective conversation the anguish of the world. So the image of the cross emerges, and I want to talk about this briefly. The image of the cross, there's an intersection here. We have this horizontal beam, which we might call the, the suffering of humanity and creation, the, the current condition of the way things are. And we have this vertical beam, which we might call that power. In the Christian imagination, this would be that divine human intersection, pointing up to God and that horizon of humanity. So at that intersection is where the human and the divine actually meet. Now, human acts of power, we can talk about divine power, which is for the good, but we also know there's a lot of human power, which can go to some very different places and yield some very different results. So I want to share with you three things about human power. Human power acts on what it reads at its intersection with human and creational suffering. I'm going to repeat that because it's a pretty big phrase. Human power, think of that, the power of governments, for example whether that's local, whether that's regional, whether that's national, international, whatever it might be. Human power acts on what it reads at its own intersection with human and creational suffering. And there can be one of three responses. One can be a response of power over. One can be a response of communion with. And one can be a response of complete indifference. Pope Francis writes a lot about indifference and the, the toxic effects of indifference on the condition of our world today. Indifference is a toxin. So this demand for courage in our lives will interrupt and inconvenience our comfortable ways of life. At this point, we know too much. As I like to say, we can't put toothpaste back into the tube. We carry within us a radical vision of good that we can no longer ignore, that the world is literally dying to experience. OK. so. I just want to say another thing about that power over and communion with. Those are important phrases to me. Power over, domination, and communion with. K 
cannot abide together. You think even within, I'm going to take a very homely example, within a marriage relationship. Power over and communion with are two different ways that relationship would be expressed. They can't abide together. It is one or it is the other, but it can't be both. So what do we know? I've got a photo here. Have any of you ever been to the very top of Spencer Butte? How many? Okay, every time I do it, I swear I will never do it again. These are the big lava boulders at the very top of that 2,000 foot high butte at the south end of Eugene. So I was up there, obviously, I took the photo. It takes courage to get up there. <laughs> so the difficult news is that a courage is being asked of us that we would rather not have to deal with. The courage to stand up and be counted. You know, I actually send postcards to my elected officials. And uh, if uh, I don't know their tradition, I just write as a, uh, uh, a uh, you know, a citizen who votes. If I know them to be of Christian faith, I let them know. As a fellow Christian, I would like to thank you for your service. And by the way, this is what you need to be paying attention to. If they are of my tradition of Catholic faith, I will say as a fellow Catholic and registered voter, I need to share something with you. Well, it takes a little courage to write these postcards. Because I have to sign my name, I have to put my address on them. A courage is being asked of us that we might rather not have to deal with today. And it's the courage to admit three things. You can write these down. For each of us personally, it is the courage to admit that current systems are not working. Now, I'm hearing that more and more people are actually recognizing current systems are not working. All you have to do is read the paper, watch the news, to see how tragically current systems are not working. Secondly, the, the courage to admit that disparities of wealth and power are not sustainable. We pretend that they are. That it can just, well, you know, it's, uh, it is what it is. Well, you know what? It takes courage to admit this is not sustainable. It is not working, and it needs to end now. The courage to admit, third, that conversion of heart is inescapable. Conversion of attitude, of spirit, and conversion of heart is inescapable. Perhaps, like me, you were horrified to see the firestorms that swept through Northern California and a few weeks later erupted and swept through Southern California. People who never, ever expected to be homeless were now living, what, in the school gymnasium or whatever place the Red Cross put together. All of a sudden, things looked different. Not to presume that they were arrogant of heart when they had a home. But conversion of heart will happen whether we say yes to it or whether we go kicking and screaming. Conversion of heart is pure grace. Conversion of heart is a gift. What's that song, tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free? That's conversion of heart. Okay. All righty. So that's the difficult news. What's the good news? The good news is, <laughs> you were hoping I'd get to the good news, the work of Church Women United, and I will say also the work of other groups that come from a place of deep moral conviction, and the work of those who live from a place of profound goodwill. The work of all of us is to bring human suffering and the capacity 
for systemic change into creative conversation for the good. I want you to circle that word capacity. There is a human capacity for good, which maybe we're tapping a little bit, but it is unlimited capacity for good because it's not starting with us. It comes from a much richer, higher, deeper source. We must hold open. You can write this down because I want you to take it with you. We must hold open a space of belief in the capacity, the human capacity, for systemic change for the good of all, all. We must defend a space of belief in that capacity. Because the opposite of that is to lose heart and to fade away. Our world is asking something more of us. So to answer the question, charity or systems change, the answer is yes. <laughs> Mercy and justice work together. Charity and systems change go hand in hand. Certainly when we look within the, the Christian community and we, when we look more broadly, we see that some people are gifted in those ways of mercy, of doing those practical deeds, of mercy and companioning. And we see other people who have that ability to bring about structural change, to organize and to bring weight to bear on systems that are broken. It takes the whole community. Is that a surprise to any of us? No, it's not. So our commitment is to actually work together in the various ways that we have been gifted, to work together for the change. I'd like to close with a quote which uh, incentivizes me very often. It's a quote from St. Teresa of Avila. She was a 16th century Spanish religious reformer. She had reform in her blood and brought about systems change that uh, were evident to her. She has these words, the world is on fire and this is no time to be concerned with unimportant things. Well, this is my reality check every once in a while. What am I concerned with today? Am I fussing around with stuff that doesn't matter? Or am I paying attention to the important things? So I say let's pledge ourselves to paying attention to the important things. And I would like to thank you for this opportunity to address you today. <laughs>